What's up everybody, it's me E-Man from E-Man's Movie Reviews. Have you watched Jordan Peele's latest movie, Us? Did you walk out of the theater with a number of questions or were you just still trying to process what you just saw? Well, don't feel bad because a number of people felt the same way, including myself. So I actually went back to the theater for a second time, took a whole bunch of notes, in an effort to try and answer a lot of those questions for you. I've noticed a lot of different videos online and articles and stuff that will try and do an endings explain or the big twist explain, but at the end of the day, they still kind of felt as though they didn't really get to the nooks and crannies of what this movie was trying to say. So in this video, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go all the way from the beginning to the very end of Us, break it all down for you, I will give you my analysis of the movie, I'll definitely dig into the big twist at the end, cover a couple of the Easter eggs, and at the very end of this video, I'm gonna cover the top five most frequent questions that I've seen online from a number of different people about the movie Us, and hopefully, regardless of whether you like the movie or not, you'll at least be able to have a deeper understanding of what was going on with this movie, and maybe even catch a couple things that you didn't notice before. Coming up next. By the way, spoiler alert, I am about to spoil the entire movie of Us. So if you haven't seen Us, feel free to go check out my spoiler free review so that way you can get a taste of what I'm about to talk about without actually ruining the movie. But if you don't care about spoilers or if you have seen Us and you really just don't feel like paying to go see it all over again to get all this stuff, sit back, relax, and let's get into it. We start off the movie informing us that below the United States, there are thousands of miles of underground tunnels and routes that we just simply have no idea about what they are, where they lead, or anything like that. This sets up the groundwork for the movie to let us know that something, or anything, could be happening underground without anyone being the wiser. In the very next scene, we see a TV on with a young Adelaide watching. We'll just call her Addie for short. For eagle-eyed viewers, you might notice that young Addie is using some scissors to cut up some paper. We then see a Hands Across America commercial, which will play an interesting part later on into this story. In the next scene, we're told that it's the year 1986, where young Addie is at a carnival with her parents on the Santa Cruz beach. At this carnival, Addie starts to wander off and we get our first glimpse of a man holding a sign with the Bible verse Jeremiah 11:11. Don't worry, we'll come back and revisit that. Addie continues to wander further away from her parents and goes into a hall of mirrors. While inside, the power goes out, and as she tries to find the exit, she bumps into another little girl that looks exactly like her. The film cuts to a room full of white bunnies locked in their cages. Don't worry, we'll definitely come back to this too. As we fast forward to present day, we join Addie, now all grown up with her family, driving to their summer home for their vacation. Her husband, Gabe, announces to the family that they will be going to the Santa Cruz beach to have some fun. As Addie thinks back about the Santa Cruz beach, we start to see some flashbacks. We cut back to the doctor's office with Addie's family, and the doctor is suggesting that Addie might have post-traumatic stress disorder. See, ever since that event in the Hall of Mirrors, Addie hasn't talked at all. So the doctor prescribed to Addie's parents that they should encourage her to do more creative activities like drawing or dancing, with the hope that she'll eventually start talking again. Despite trying to convince her husband not to go to Santa Cruz Beach, Addie reluctantly agrees to go anyway. Gabe shows off his new boat to the family that he just acquired. As the family drives to the beach, they pass an ambulance tending to a dead body. Turns out that the same man from 1986 who was holding that Bible verse had passed away. The family meets up with their family friends at the beach, and Addie is still a bit on edge while she's there. Her younger son, Jason, goes to the bathroom on the beach and sees a weird figure standing and looking off into the distance with bloody hands. Addie can't find her son, Jason, and she starts to panic. After finding Jason, her family decides to leave the beach soon after. Addie confesses to her husband about the day in the Hall of Mirrors, 
and the little girl in the mirror that she saw. Gabe, of course, isn't understanding the real issue and brushes it off. That is, until Jason lets the family know that there's a strange family outside on their driveway. Gabe goes out to confront them and the strange group just stands there. Addie calls the police, but of course, we all know that the police in horror movies, well, they're pretty much useless most of the time. The strange group manages to break into the residence, thanks to a hidden key, and begins to hold the family hostage. It's at this point that we all realize that this group are actually clones of the main family. Of course, these doppelgangers have some differences. The leader of the group, who looks exactly like Addie, is called Red. Red tells a story about a girl who had a shadow. In the story, the girl would eat warm cooked food while the shadow was forced to eat raw bloody rabbits. During Christmas, the girl would get soft, cushy toys, while the shadow would get sharp, cold toys that would cut her. The girl would marry a handsome prince, while the shadow was forced to be with another man, mainly because that man was connected to the prince. Red continues to recount that when the shadow had to give birth to her daughter, the daughter came out to be a monster. And when the second child was born, the girl had a c-section, while the shadow had to cut herself in order to give birth to her son. The shadow named her son Pluto, and said he was born to love fire. Now Red is obviously telling a story about herself and Addie, with Red being the shadow and Addie being the girl in the story. Red continues to reiterate her hatred for Addie, and that her resentment has been building up for a long time. Red also makes a very interesting confession when she says that there was a day that she realized that she was being tested by God. Gabe interrupts Red to ask, just what is it that they want and who are they? Red replies, we're Americans. This is probably the point in the movie where we get the most clear and obvious social commentary. I will absolutely come back to this and this will probably be the most important theme to understand in the whole movie. But let's get back to the story. So chaos ensues as Red has Andy handcuffed to the table and the rest of the family is separated by their doubles. We get a moment where something is revealed to us when we see Pluto and Jason in the closet. They appear to be playing a sort of game and what is shown here is that both of them are still connected together. This will prove to be an important part in the story later as well. Anyway, so the family continues to fight against their individual evil copies and after either killing some or evading some of them, they eventually reunite on Gabe's boat. They head on over to their family friend's home to find refuge. However, to their surprise, their friends have already been murdered by their own evil doubles too. Addie is captured by the evil friend doubles and held hostage. Addie's children come in and save her by whooping the hell out of those evil doubles. As the family regains control of the house, they see on the news that this event seems to be going on almost on a national level. Doubles are all dressed in red with scissors in hand and starting to join hands. Once the family starts to realize how dangerous this situation is getting, they all decide to just hop in the car and get out of town. Unfortunately, they forget the actual car keys, so Addie goes back into the house to grab them as she notices one of the evil twins that she thought she killed, that she thought was dead, wasn't actually dead. Because, you know, it wouldn't be a horror movie without having someone you thought was dead actually not be dead so that they can do a nice little jump scare later on. Anyway, Addie finds this evil twin and goes ahead and just kills him off. As this is happening, her son Jason walks in and notices the gruesome mess that his mother has left. As Addie and her family go to the car to make a run for it, they're met up with their daughter's evil twin named Umbre. After an interesting game of chicken, they throw her off the car and into the woods where she's impaled and left to die. Addie runs out of the car to go check on her, and instead of trying to kill her off, it would appear that Addie has a moment of sympathy as this evil doppelganger starts to die. As they travel back to their home, they notice that Pluto has set their family car on fire. Addie gets out of the car to confront Pluto, but Jason realizes that the whole thing is a trap. Going back to an earlier point, Jason recalls that Pluto and him are still tethered or connected and uses this connection to make Pluto walk backwards into the fire and die. Once again, we get another moment where Addie does not seem necessarily ready to hurry up and kill Pluto, 
But instead, she hesitates and has yet another moment of sympathy for the dying doppelganger. Unfortunately, there seemed to be another layer to this trap because Red was waiting and took Jason down into the underground area where all the clones were from. Addie goes solo on this mission deep down into the bowels of this underground area. Jordan Peele gets some nice credit here for setting up the atmosphere with this hellish setting. It's kind of reminiscent of a sort of dissension into Dante's hell mixed in with some Freddy Krueger boiler room scenes too. Addie reaches the classroom where Red is cutting up paper into figures that are holding hands. During this confrontation and standoff, Red finally gives us a whole lot of details and clues as to everything that's been going on. So let's break some of it down. Red tells Addie that all of the clones down there, or the tethered, were just as human as the people above. She continues by saying that humans built this place and that she believes that the humans figured out how to copy the body, but not the soul. Furthermore, she believed that it is the soul that is shared by the two bodies, which is why the clones are tethered to the people above. Red then continues to say that the humans that created the tethered were trying to control the people above. So in a way, I guess we can kind of think of the tethered people as kind of like human voodoo dolls. Now this idea of having people controlled from below goes back to a one-liner from Addie's daughter, Zora, Earlier in the movie, she casually mentions that she had heard that the government has been putting fluoride in the water and using that as a means to control people's minds. While the government involvement is not actually confirmed in the movie, it's the best that we can go off of right now. But anyway, let's get back to the story. Red continues on to say that the humans who created the Tethered failed in their goal to create human puppets and they abandoned them. With no direction, the Tethered went crazy. Red says that both her and Addie were born special. And this is the part of the movie where we start to see the camera go back and forth from the above world and to the below tunnels with all the tethered people mimicking the actions of those above. Red tells Addie that she believes that God brought them together that faithful night when they walked into the Hall of Mirrors. Red confesses to Addie how she's never stopped thinking about Addie and how Addie could have taken Red with her to the above world. After a couple of years, Red tells Addie that a miracle happened when Addie was learning how to dance in the world above. Since they were both tethered together, Red also began to learn how to dance down below and took that as being a miracle from God. The other tethered people saw that Red was very different and viewed Red as their new leader and savior. So Red planned for years and years after so much obsessing, not only to kill Addie, but as she said, she also wanted to make a statement to the entire world. Red wanted to lead a revolution and she was going to use the Hands Across America ideal as the basis. At this point, both Red and Addie start fighting each other with Red using the precision and agility that she learned from Addie's dancing in order to stab her repeatedly. Of course, like any classic villain, Red gets a little bit too overconfident toying with her prey and Addie is able to stab her and choke her to death. Addie finds her son Jason hiding in a locker and they all get into an ambulance to drive to safety. As the family is driving away in the ambulance, we finally have the truth and the big twist of the movie revealed. Turns out that when Addie went into the Hall of Mirrors and saw that evil twin, the twin choked out Addie, crushing her throat. The evil twin dragged Addie into the tunnel and handcuffed her down there and escaped the underground to become the new Addie. So we basically had a major switcheroo happen where Red has been the real Adelaide all along and the Addie that we've come to know has been the tethered clone living in the above world. So now we know the real reason why as a little girl, the tethered Addie wasn't able to talk because none of the tethered were able to talk. However, this tethered version of Addie was able to learn how to talk only after being exposed to all the creative activities like drawing and dancing in order to express herself. We also know that the reason why Red was talking so strangely was because of the strangulation during the encounter with the tethered Addie. As the family drives off into the country, Jason takes a long look at his mother and she looks back at him with a faint smile and he puts his mask right back on. We conclude the movie with the camera expanding out, showing the large number of doppelgangers 
who have now replicated the Hands Across America emblem and have joined hands across a large stretch of land. Well, that was us. And yeah, that was a lot that just happened, right? Especially with the twist. But there's one thing that I think is pretty important with this movie, and that is to understand the themes that are going on. And once you understand the themes that are at work here, I do think that you're going to be able to look at this movie in a whole different way and just make a little bit more sense of it. So to get an idea of those themes, let's just start off with Jordan Peele's own words. This movie is about this country. We're in a time where we fear the other, whether it's the mysterious invader that we think is going to come and kill us and take our jobs, or the faction we don't live near, who voted a different way than us. We're all about pointing the finger, and I wanted to suggest that maybe the monster we really need to look at has our face. Maybe the evil, it's us. I think one of the most important things to do when you're going in to watch the movie Us is to kind of get a sense of like what the themes are doing. So one of the major themes that Jordan Peele is talking about is the fear of the other. And that's a very interesting fear that a lot of us can have. And it can range from a number of different things, whether it's ethnicity, politics, uh, immigration, whatever. People sometimes can fear what is other than themselves. And another working theme that is at play here is the concept of privilege. Now, one thing I do want to make clear is the idea that privilege is not always a monetary or financial type of thing. I mean, that can play a part of it, but privilege is always in the sense of being in relation to another. When you understand those themes and the intention that Peel was going for, you can see how they played out in the movie. So let's look at some examples of how privilege and the fear of the other are played out in the film. So in the movie, the relation of privilege is between the people above ground and the tethered people below. Red made that clear when she listed off those things that she suffered from, like having to eat raw rabbits, not being able to choose the person she loves, to even having to deliver her own child. Red essentially demonstrates that Addie enjoyed a lot of things in life in a much more comfortable and privileged way. The interesting thing about that scene was that we got our most obvious social commentary during the scene where Abe asked, who are you people? And Red answered, we're Americans. I believe that Peel is using this dynamic to illustrate how some Americans can live a privileged life and completely ignore or be ignorant to our fellow Americans who are also suffering right under our noses. What I liked about this duality in the themes is that it can be applicable to a number of different social issues. The quote-unquote other and the fear of the other can be applicable to race, class, wealth, or even immigration. We have American citizens that are literally afraid of other American immigrants coming into this country trying to replace us. You have people in this country who have some of the best health care while other Americans can't afford it or are dying from the lack of it. Remember that scene where Abe took Gabe's glasses? Gabe has had the privilege of having health care, you know, to go get glasses and to be able to see clearly, while Abe has never even experienced that. He's probably gone a lot of his tethered life walking around with blurred vision. You also have other instances of privilege when it comes to racial tensions when one ethnicity gets disproportionately targeted and the other turns a blind eye. All these situations, if not more, are being echoed through the theme of otherness and the fear of it. But let's talk about that twist ending. Because I'll be honest, I actually thought that the twist ending was kind of unnecessary at first until I started to understand the themes and apply them to what the movie was trying to convey. I believe by having Addie and Red switch places, it proves something interesting for both the story and the social commentary Peel was getting at. For the sake of the story, Red informed us that she believed that the humans who created the Tethered could not replicate a soul for them. So instead, they had to share one soul with two bodies. Well, it would appear that Addie's life in the above world proved that the tethered could possibly live fully functional lives if they were given the actual opportunity, access, and the resources. We were led to believe that because the tethered couldn't talk, that they were indeed soulless. Well, I think Addie disproved that notion seeing as though she is a tethered clone. I think the same applies with the social message that Peel was trying to convey. If we look at this from a class perspective, let's pretend that Addie was originally poor. But then let's say she traded places with like a rich twin from above. 
Well, Addie learned how to dance, find love, have a family and friends, and lead a very productive life. So I think what Peel is trying to show with the twist in this movie is that if the people that we think are others were given the same opportunities and privileges as the people above, maybe those others could also gain a soul of their own. Now, it doesn't end there. If we stay focused on the twist ending, let's also look at the other side of that with Addie too. Addie not only is one of the tethered people, but she sure as hell wasn't going to go back to that status either. She was willing not only to fight, but to become a monster herself in order to protect the privilege that she had already taken. That goes back to Peel's commentary about how we can become the very monsters we think we're fearing. That monster could very well have our same face or we could become the monsters too. Okay, so now let me just go over five of the most prevailing questions I've seen online. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of other questions that I can go over, but this video would be going on forever. So I'm just going to go over my top five questions that I've seen out there and I'll give you my take on them. So let's get to it. So let's get started with what was the deal with the Bible verse Jeremiah 11:11? 11, 11? Well, the Bible verse goes as follows. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry on to me, I will not hearken unto them. I believe that in the movie, when Red talks about miracles and signs from God, she essentially became kind of like a Nat Turner type of figure from Birth of a Nation. And what I mean by that is she essentially became like a spiritual leader who wanted to lead a revolution that she believed was assigned to her by God. So in the case of Jeremiah 11:11, 11, 11, I believe that Red just saw herself as kind of like a vehicle of God's wrath upon the people that she blamed for all of her suffering. Another interesting question is, who exactly is behind all of this? Well, the movie does not explicitly say who did all of it, but that's more than likely an intentional move by Jordan Peele. He stated in a number of interviews that he wanted to keep things ambiguous so audiences can basically just make up their own minds. However, the leading thought out there is that the perpetrator in this film is actually the government or maybe some secret society, or whatever. Red says that humans were the ones that created the tethered and abandoned them for generations. We also got that line from Zora saying that the government is controlling people with fluoride in the water. I believe that this is another bit of social commentary from Peel. I think what we can draw from this is that the real enemy in the movie are the humans, or the government, that abandoned the tethered people. It's almost like if a government left their people with no clean water or something. Now, as a result of ditching the tethered, they were left with no direction or purpose, and according to Red, they went crazy because of that. The messed up thing here is that the tethered people decided to focus their attention on their counterparts, or fellow Americans, rather than trying to focus their attention on the humans that created them and left them there to suffer. So it could be that Peel is saying that we need to start shifting our attention to those people that are in power rather than fighting one another. Because at the end of the day, we're all connected. Okay, another interesting question was, what's the deal with the rabbits? Now, this is just my own theory, but I do think that the rabbits just might have started out as test subjects for the cloning process that was going on down there. Of course, since the tethered were left to fend for themselves, I think they released the rabbits, allowing them to reproduce, and thus becoming a steady food source for the tethered people to eat. There's also the possibility that the rabbits were symbolic of the white rabbit from Alice in Wonderland. You know, seeing as though Addie kept traveling further and further down the tunnels with a bunch of rabbits all along the way. By the way, a fun Easter egg was that the daughter Zora was wearing a rabbit on her shirt, and when she wore the shirt that said, though, that actually is Vietnamese for the word rabbit. And another obvious question is, what was the deal with the Hands Across America stuff? Well, don't feel bad. Like, unless you grew up in the 80s, you probably just never heard of the Hands Across America. But it was a big deal in the mid-80s. It was a huge charitable event that involved a lot of celebrities and musicians and big businesses 
that had a goal of trying to fight world hunger and homelessness. Only problem is that it was a logistical nightmare. I wouldn't say it's exactly the same thing, but I guess some people could say that it was kind of like the fire festival of the 80s. In one of the first scenes of the movie, we see the commercial for Hands Across America, which a young Red is actually watching at a very young age, before she gets captured and tossed into the tethered undergrounds. So because this was like the last thing that Red had really seen as a child, it's kind of understandable that this would make a big impression on her. That impression lasted even longer as Red was left with a Hands Across America t-shirt and she obsessed over it and Addie for years and years. Recall that Red said that killing Addie wasn't enough and that sending a message to the world was also part of the plan. So Red was only left with all that she knew and the biggest most impactful plan that she can think of was the Hands Across America campaign. And of course, seeing as though that the tethered people saw Red as being very special and unique and in a sense she's also kind of like their spiritual leader, they followed Red's plan to mimic the Hands Across America campaign in order to basically give out a big statement to the world that would appear to be kind of like a revolutionary statement. Okay, so what's the deal with Jason? So there's a lot of questions that revolve around Jason's character. Some people are throwing out some wild theories about him being switched with Pluto and whether he was a tethered person all this time and all this other stuff and so on and so forth. Well, let me try and clarify this with my own opinion and some facts from the movie. First off, given the big reveal with Addie's character being a tethered person all this time, I think we have to understand the implications of what that means for her family. In the living room, Red said that she gave birth to Pluto and that he had a love for fire. So right off the bat, we can eliminate the notion that Pluto and Jason had been switched because Red had clearly raised Pluto up until this time. That also means that Jason is Addie's biological son too. And since the twist revealed that Addie is a tethered clone, that means that Jason and his sister Zora are in a sense biracial. Jason is a byproduct of a tethered clone mating with a normal person. So this would actually explain why Jason seems so weird. It would also account for why Addie felt the need to try and teach Jason how to snap on beat during the I Got Five On It song. As some people have noticed, even Addie was offbeat herself when she was trying to teach him how to get in rhythm. But just think, why would anyone teach their kid rhythm unless they were born without a soul? So now we can kind of go back and look at that final shot of Jason looking at his mother and deciding to put on his mask. I thought it was a really interesting moment because throughout the movie, Jason has always been wearing a mask and it's not like it's Halloween or anything. But even more specifically, Jason's mask was that of a monster. So when Jason has witnessed his mother doing some really gruesome things, I think that Jason choosing to put on a monster mask symbolizes how we function in society in a way. We may literally see the horrors and the ugly truth in society, other people, or even in our friends and family, but rather than confronting those issues, we tend to put on our monster mask and continue about our day. This might signify the notion that Jason knows just how much of a monster his mother can be, but he's willing to put a figurative and literal mask on to continue living life just as usual and ignore that ugly truth. Well, those are my thoughts on the movie Us along with my breakdown and analysis and I I know that there are a ton of questions and Easter eggs and way more theories that could be made about this movie. And there's absolutely no way I even have the amount of time to cover every single one of them. But I would love for you all to mention your thoughts and ideas and commentary in the comments down below, because I know we can definitely talk about all of this for a long time. So please Go in the comments. Let me know what you thought. Was there anything in this movie that really stood out to you? Do you still have some lingering questions? Whatever it is, put it in the comments because I look forward to reading them and getting back to you guys as best as I can. As always, thank you so much for sticking with me and watching this entire video. If you found this video to be helpful, feel free to share it with some friends. If you're new to my channel, please consider subscribing for more. I've got more videos and reviews to do for you all. And until next time, I'll see you all later.